subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Hello and welcome to the print. I'm Stanish Alex Philip, and you're watching Soft Cover, the print's platform for the launch of select fiction books. And today I have a very interesting book with me. This book takes you into the past, that is the history, and also into the present and possibly the future aspect. Uh, before I go ahead, let me introduce. Uh, you know the author to you viewers and the author is uh, you know canadian journalist terry milovsky and uh, welcome to the print i'm looking forward to it so uh, you know he's written a very beautiful book and i read through it in one go it's very interesting and the book is actually blood for blood 50 years of the global Khalistan Project, published by Harper Collins. So, uh, tell you this, this first question that comes to my mind is, how come the Canadian journalist is writing this book? It's a, it's a reasonable question, isn't it? What have I got to do with it? Um, it uh, and the answer is uh, that the Khalistani movement has a great deal to do with Canada. Uh, you'll recall, of course, the Kanishka bombing, as Indians know it, the Air India Flight 182 uh, that was bombed in uh, 1985 uh, by Khalistani extremists who were Canadian citizens, by the way. Yeah. And I was sent to cover that bombing and uh, never forgot it, was never able to shake the story, uh, was never able to fully explain why this happened, yeah. uh, and the roots of it, of course, were deep within India, but also in Canada. The bombs were placed in Canada by Canadian citizens, so it became my business whether I liked it or not. Well, you know, there you go. Uh, and, you know, Terry has covered the Khalistan uh, movement or the Khalistan process in, a, uh, in Canada very closely. Uh, he's interviewed, he's met with a number of people who are actually victims of uh, this particular movement. And, uh, you know, Terry, coming to your book, in the initial chapters itself, you know, you talk about uh, Khalistan movement and you mention that a generation later, the dream of an independent land of the pure still has some allure for a small minority in the global Sikh diaspora but no, not so much in back home, that is India. Why is that so? Uh, well, that's another interesting question, isn't it? Because it seems to have been, it seems to be the case that the people who really experienced uh, the uh, full fury, if you will, of the Khalistan independence movement, the people who live in India and notably in Punjab, have lost interest in this project long ago. Uh, they their peak was perhaps 1989 when they managed to elect some members of parliament. Uh, since then, for 30 years, they've been going downhill to the point where now, uh, within Punjab, you're free to run uh, as a separatist, if you like, for election, uh, but you can't win because uh, the voters have simply, the Sikh, overwhelmingly Sikh voters in Punjab, have utterly deserted the separatist cause to the point where in the last vote, I believe, uh, they obtained a, a share of the vote, which was, the best you can say was it wasn't actually zero, but it was yeah. very close to zero. It was a fraction yeah. of 1% of the vote. Whereas in the diaspora, as you point out, uh, the flame is still alive, possibly because, I'm speculating now, um, Obviously, the Sikh diaspora was self-selected. The reason they left India was they weren't content to live in India. So they were self-selected to be those who were not happy with life in India. Uh, and also because the more they were banned from visiting India because of perceived Khalistani sympathies perceived by the Indian government, the less they knew of real life 
in today's India, which is not the same as it was in 1984, when there were horrendous massacres in India, as you well know, we'll go, get into the history if you like. But the short answer to your question is that in the diaspora, the cause survives because the old guard keep it alive. That is their memory. That is the India that they left behind. And in their minds, it has not changed that much. They're, they ask for remembrance constantly of what they call the 1984 genocide of the Sikhs following the assassination of uh, Indira Gandhi. Uh, and uh, they're not going to let go. They won't let it go. And uh, they are teaching. Uh, many Indians will find this surprising, I know, but uh, the Khalistani hardliners, dead enders if you like, uh, keep the flame alive and they are teaching their children that the people who bombed Air India, for example, were heroes, not terrorists. Yeah. And they put up pictures of the, uh, what is in fact Canada's worst ever mass murderer, Talvinder Singh Parma, the mastermind, the leader of the plot to blow up Air India with the loss of 331 civilian lives, completely innocent lives, who had nothing to do with the struggle whatsoever. And they put up posters of Parma calling him a Shaheed, by Shaheed Talvinder Singh Baba. And they, they glorify him as a hero and martyr of the Sikh nation. So it's very much alive in the diaspora. And I, I personally think it's a shame. Well, uh, you know, I will completely agree to what you said. It's actually a shame uh, that uh, it is still alive in the diaspora, as you uh, rightly mentioned. Uh, you know, in your book itself, you've answered this question and you, you uh, bring out the fact that Sikhs are not aliens in India. You know, they weren't before partition and they are in now. The only 2% of India's immense population, they have succeeded far beyond the numbers of the military, the professions and the bureaucracy. Today, India had a Sikh president and also a Sikh prime minister of distinction. Of course, you are referring to uh, Manmohan Singh. Uh, you know, you, since you've mentioned about the diaspora, uh, this is something, you know, has, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to this, uh, this particular movement, two countries, you know, come to the fore. One is, of course, UK and the other is Canada, you know. But uh, if you actually look into the 1980s also, and as your book rightly mentioned, that the Indian government was not happy with the way the Canadian authorities were handling uh, this particular movement. Uh, and this book also mentions, you know, that, uh, you know, they were complaining in, ex in explicit terms that Sikh groups in Canada were financing violence in India while receiving multiculturalism funds from the government in Ottawa. Indirectly, in other words, Canadian taxpayers were paying to kill Indians. How did this happen? Uh, well, that's an embarrassing question for any Canadian, um, <clears throat> but since you've raised it, I guess I'd better deal with it. It's embarrassing because it forces me to admit that the Canadian political system has to a large degree accommodated, tolerated, enabled uh, the uh, Khalistan movement, even to its own disadvantage, because politicians appreciate the help of an organized group who will come at election time to lick envelopes, knock on doors, and bring them thousands of votes in some cases. Uh, and they are quite prepared. I know this would never happen in India, that politicians would look, look the other way at this sort of thing, but uh, in Canada at any rate, they're quite prepared to look the other way if those same political volunteers at election time are putting up posters of Talvin de Parma as a hero and martyr of the Sikh nation. They look away. Most Canadians don't know what that's about. They don't make an issue of it. They rarely condemn it. You have to force them to do so. You say, really, really, you're, you're gonna put up with it? You think that's okay, putting up posters of Canada's worst ever mass murderer as though he's a hero? And then they will say, no, 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 you don't agree with that at all. But they don't come out and do anything about it uh, unless you press them. And so it's the accommodation made by the political system and by politicians, and I'm speaking here of all parties, 
This is not a partisan thing. Liberals, conservatives, the, all of them. Uh, they, they, they appreciate organized help and uh, the separatist minority, and we're talking here about a small minority, uh, they know how to exploit that political leverage to obtain concessions. For example, a couple of years ago, I guess it's 2018, the government put out a public safety report on national security, sort of stuff that nobody ever reads. Uh, and it said that uh, Khalistani extremism uh, continues to be a threat in Canada because of the evidence of people worshiping and glorifying the Air India bomber, for example, although that's not the only example. And uh, the uh, separatist movement in Canada was able to use its political leverage to call in its chips, as it was, to call in the debt owed to them by politicians that it had helped elect to edit that report, to take out the words Khalistani extremism uh, and to soften the report so it didn't point the finger at Khalistani extremism. So this is an example of how it works in the political system in Canada. And that too is a shame. Well, uh, you know, you, you brought it out very clearly, uh, the fact that uh, this Khalistani movement or the Khalistani sympathizers in Canada uh, has, is a considerable vote bank that no party, and I repeat, no party really wants to ignore. You know, uh, am I right? Yes, that's right. I mean, they're, they're, they're quite small in number, but they're much bit more organized than the rest. I mean, most Sikh Canadians, most Indian Canadians, just like the rest of us, they're busy uh, working, they're hardworking people. A lot of them are professionals. They contribute a lot to the community uh, and uh, they're not interested in, in this old country politics. That's one reason they came here, get away from all of that. Uh, and uh, they're, they're not involved, but nor are they involved in an organized way in pushing back on the Khalistanis. So you have a small group that is focused and organized and a large group which really isn't interested. Well, you know, and, uh, and this inaction or let's say the, uh, the, uh, the kind of a tacit support that was there from the Canadian, uh, you know, uh, political parties, you know, was there right from the very beginning. And you bring out a very, uh, uh, an example of this, how this has actually, uh, you know, uh, created more, uh, you know, uh, violence. And you mentioned that uh, it was in, uh, it was in the 1980s that, uh, you know, Kulvinder Singh Malhi, you know, one of Balraj Diol's unpunished attackers. Yes. You know, he went to a Pakistani training camp for Khalistani recruits from Canada and then crossed into India. And in July 1987, he joined the Khalistan Commando Force Death Squad, which attacked a bus near the village of village in Punjab. And this was this was you know one of the biggest massacre that yes. Punjab had witnessed then. You know, so yes. had you know the Canadian police really taken that attack seriously on Balraj Theol then things would have, would have been different, right, sir? Yes, that is true. I think Canada has something to answer for in that respect. Again, it's an embarrassing question for a Canadian because this was a young man, a uh, teenager really, uh, who took part in an absolutely vicious, near fatal attack on uh, a, a young Sikh, a 28-year-old Sikh, uh, who at the time of the uh, 1985, the uh, Rajiv Longawal agreement, a compromise agreement uh, between uh, uh, Sikhs in Punjab and the central government in New Delhi, he said, let's give peace a chance. That was his crime. He said, let's, he called a press conference with some Hindu friends. They had a Sikh Hindu alliance and they said, let's give peace a chance. Let's support this agreement. Maybe it will reduce the, blo the bloodshed. And for that, he was beaten within an inch of his life by five young men, including the one that you mentioned. The police didn't think much of it. Well, it's an internal squabble, but he survived, barely. He had one working limb. All the others were broken. His fingers were smashed from protecting his head yeah. as they beat him with baseball bats and hockey sticks. 
And the police thought, well, this is an internal problem that is not really our concern. They didn't investigate it aggressively. They thought, well, Balraj Diyal, you know, he's friendly with the, with the Indian consulate in, in Toronto. And you know what the Sikhs are saying, meaning the militant Sikhs, they say, oh, well, India blew up Air India. India blew up its own plane. That's what they were saying to divert suspicion. And the police said, well, you know, so maybe it's some sort of reprisal thing. We don't understand. We don't care. Let it go. And then Mali graduated to bigger atrocities, joined the killer squad, the death squad that you mentioned, and the, the, the massacre at Lauru, where I, I believe 38 people were killed. Yeah. Hindus were dragged off a bus, lined up and shot. Then very soon after, another bus was attacked by the same group with another 20-some people killed. It was a horrendous weekend. Uh, and that really has a lot to do with what Canada did not do about the beating of Balraj Diyal for the crime of saying, give peace a chance. Well, absolutely. And, uh, you know, viewers, I'd like to mention here that uh, this book, again, The Blood for Blood, 50 Years of the Global Khalistan Project, has been extensively researched, you know, and, uh, you know, Terry, of course, brings out a lot of facets of this particular movement that one, uh, you know, since many of our viewers are young viewers, uh, they would not be aware of. And it actually delves into the history of this particular movement and also the future. And, uh, you know, this, this is a, there's an interesting chapter, you know, uh, which is about what is Khalistan? You know, what is that they want? And it brings out... Uh, uh, a, a map that was brought out by the six protesters, you know, which is very active on social media uh, these days. And there's a map that has been brought out, which is the proposed Republic of Khalistan. And as Terry mentions, you know, and this map clearly shows that the Khalistan would be include Himachal Pradesh, Punjab, the Bikane, Rajasthan area, Haryana, and even New Delhi. Yes. But strangely, as uh, Terry points out, that while, you know, the focus on Khalistan and while, of course, Delhi is also part of Khalistan, uh, there is no mention of Lahore. You know, uh, why is that so, Terry? That, that's a, 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 another embarrassing question, but not for me. Uh, it's an embarrassing question for the Khalistanis who put out this map. By the way, the map was... Uh, made public by Sikhs for Justice. They put it on their Facebook page, but it was actually generated, it was produced at the World Sikh Organization's annual convention, and it was uh, produced originally by uh, Simranjit Singh Man's splinter group of the Shiramani Akali Dal, uh, yeah. the Amritsa sort of sp separatist splinter group, if you will, of the main uh, Sikh political party. Uh, so it, it, all, all of the groups uh, associated to the separatist movement, the WSO, the Sikhs for Justice, and Simranjit Singh's Man's Party, all, were all involved in producing and publishing this map. But the question you're, you're asking is the important one. How come that Khalistan includes big chunks of India that are not in Punjab, that are not historically Sikh lands, Absolutely. but does not but does not include the historically Sikh lands in Pakistan. You mentioned Lahore. Lahore was was the seat of the Sikh Empire and, uh, under Maharaja Ranjit, Ranjit Singh. Yeah, absolutely fundamental to Sikh history and culture. What about Nankana Sahib, the birthplace of Guru Nanak, no less? Uh, that's not on the map either. So it's very interesting to look at the map and see that everything that's in India is up for grabs. They claim that as part of the future Khalistan. But as soon as you cross the Radcliffe line, as soon as you look at Pakistan, they make no demands at all on Pakistan. And yet Pakistan is allegedly the friend of, uh, the great friend of the separatist movement, which has provided safe haven and refuge and weapons and training for Khalistani militants for nigh on 50 years. So it's, 
I think it's a reasonable question to ask, why is this the case? And the most uh, persuasive answer I've heard is that they don't want to alienate Pakistan. Pakistan's uh, indulgence, to put it no more strongly than that, of the Khalistan cause has been a lifeline for that cause. There's nowhere else that you can hide out and train and cross the border and run uh, massacre operations inside Indian Punjab. There's, there's only Pakistan. Without Pakistan, they don't really have much future. So they don't want to trespass upon Pakistan's generosity, apparently. In fact, they go even further. You mentioned the map. They're just not making claims on Pakistan. They're not uh, provoking their patron. But they go further. Uh, Sikhs for Justice, for example, has written to Prime Minister Imran Khan of Pakistan, pledging that all Khalistani Sikhs will come to the aid and support Pakistan if India ever attacks Pakistan. They will fight for Pakistan against India. So that's going quite far, isn't it? And uh, so you have to think that there's, there's a reason for this. And I think the reason is quite apparent. They are not willing to do without the support of Pakistan because they know it's essential to the survival of the Khalistan cause. You also mentioned that the Khalistani-Pakistani alliance is actually the most uncomfortable marriage of convenience. You know, and uh, you bring out the fact that it, in Pakistan, why Pakistan actually supported this whole uh, Khalistan movement, pumped money into it, uh, gave uh, the uh, the uh, the terrorists then uh, lots of arms and ammunition, including Dragunov sniper rifles that the Indian Army actually uses, AK-47s, is primarily because of what happened in 1971. You know, which was the liberation, the Bangladesh Liberation War. Yes. They wanted to get revenge for the defeat. The, a, a, your younger audience won't remember this, but there was an extremely humiliating defeat of Pakistan by Indian forces in 1971, December of 71, when uh, what was then originally intended to be East Pakistan was broken off and became independent by Bangladesh. It was, a, it was a deep humiliation, not only for the loss of Bangladesh, but also because some 90,000 Pakistani troops had to surrender to Indian forces. Not a great day for Pakistan. And uh, there are several sources. I, I, I cite uh, one in particular in the, in the book about the desire of the Pakistani leadership to, do the, to get back at India for that humiliation by breaking off a piece in turn of India and, and, and it would be Khalistan. Uh, bear in mind that they're saying that we, the Pakistanis, will take that piece. They didn't say that the Sikhs will have it for themselves for an independent nation. Perhaps it would be a nation under Pakistani supervision, uh, which is another reason why uh, votes for an independent Khalistan are so hard to find. Uh, there are not too many Khalistanis who really want to live under the thumb of Pakistan, which of course is increasingly under the thumb of China, which is a whole other question. Well, and I was exactly going to come to that, uh, your chapter 12, where you talk about China, Pakistan and the six for justice. And, uh, you know, you, you described uh, Pakistan actually as a wholly owned subsidiary of China. And you say Pakistan, it seems, is to be China's highway to the Arabian Sea. So what is it? What's the China angle uh, to this particular Khalistan movement that is there happening at this particular uh, day among the diaspora outside? Well, it, it, it's... That's a very interesting question, particularly to a defense specialist like yourself, because of what's been happening in recent years, notably the clash at Ladakh uh, in 2020 uh, on the China front. Because it's important to remember that the Khalistan movement, has, it, it's never been based on a, some sort of democratic vote. Nobody elected the Khalistan commando force. 
Nobody elected the Baba Khalsa and said, it's the will of the people that you go blow up a, a plane, plane load of 300 Canadians. Uh, it was never based on popular support. And I mentioned that because simply because there is no popular support doesn't mean, as we've seen, that the cause of Khalistan doesn't survive. It does survive. And the geopolitical situation is changing importantly now. Because China has lent to and invested in Pakistan such massive amounts of money, it's been compared to the Marshall Plan after World War II, whereby the United States rebuilt all of Europe. Uh, it's on a similar scale, roads, ports, you name it, infrastructure everywhere, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, because uh, China has been so very generous to Pakistan, Pakistan is indeed becoming a wholly owned subsidiary of China. It's becoming uh, locked into China's orbit and China's trading system and tri China's political agenda. Now, we know that Pakistan has an agenda to try to break off a piece of India, uh, namely Khalistan, uh, as a strategic buffer zone between Pakistan and India, to cut off India's land access to Kashmir, another important priority for the Pakistani leadership. So given all of that, given the alliance between China and Pakistan, you have to wonder, and, and it's interesting, I've looked Recently, if you follow at all what the Chinese are saying about this, if you look, for example, at the semi-official, uh, the People's Daily owns uh, an English language paper called Global yeah. Times. I won't get into the details, but there's been an article there at the end of last year, for example, uh, a, a semi-official article saying, by the way, Indians should understand that if they're going to support the independence of Taiwan, which China considers part of its territory, then we can, in retaliation, support independence movements within India. Oh, it's interesting that they bring that up, isn't it? Uh, so India now faces uh, what used to be thought of as a two-front war, Pakistan and China, on the northern border. Or is it a one-front war with two enemies. Uh, that's another interesting question. Is it already a one, basically one, one confrontation with people wearing different uniforms, but they're on the same team? So uh, we don't know the answers to, to how, where this is going to take the Khalistan movement, but we know those things, that it's not about pop popular support. It's about geopolitical strategy in the case of Pakistan, they're not supporting the Khalistan movement because they think it's great for the Sikhs and they love the Sikhs. Good heavens, in Pakistan today, Sikhs continue to be the victims of forced conversions, the abductions of Sikh girls, attacks on Gurdwaras. Why has the population, the Sikh population of Pakistan been declining precipitously for years? It's as though partition is still going on. They're being driven out by these abuses against all religious minorities in Pakistan. So, no, it's not because Pakistan loves the Sikhs and wants them to be free. Wants them to be free in India, but not in Pakistan, apparently. Well, uh, you know, that is true. And, you, you know, this comes to my last question. And you, you mentioned about the fact that it is not a popular movement, you know, as it is made, made it out to be on the social media. And you also have examples. You've also put out examples of, you know, Sikh for Justice offers iPhone 12 for students in Punjab. You know, if they raise the Khalistan uh, flag, then of course there were cash uh, offers for farmers and all. But there is no evidence of any money have, or iPhones have had to have actually uh, been given to uh, whoever, the minority who actually did it. Uh, and this brings to our last question. What, where do you think uh, this particular Khalistan movement is heading to. You know, you of course have it very strong the diaspora back in uh, back in the country, as you rightly mentioned in the book. There is actually no one is identifies itself with this with this with this whole uh, idea. But back in, but in the among the diaspora community, how do you see this going forward? Well, uh, I would like to tell you that it's dying out, but it isn't. 
I'm mindful of a story told recently by the son of a murdered witness at the Air India trial. I'm referring to a gentleman by the name of Tara Singh Hare, who was the publisher of the Indo-Canadian Times in Vancouver on Canada's West Coast in British Columbia. And he was prepared, he heard some very telling evidence about the Air India bombing. He offered to testify and he was murdered before he had the chance to do, to testify and his son testified at an inquiry. And the son told the story of a young girl. And this is recently, this was in 2015, that he told this story. A young girl, I think she was about 12 years old, saying, well, why do you always call the, the Air India bombers terrorists? They're heroes, not terrorists. And he described how he was, he's, was taken aback and explained to the girl, well, what about the, the people on the plane who died? What about their families and the grief caused to them? Don't you think about that? And she said, oh, right, yeah, I, I didn't think of that. Now, if that is a reflection of the future of the Khalistan movement, if it means that the praise and glorification and the martyr posters honoring the likes of Tolwinda Pama as a hero, if it's working, as that story suggests, then it's not dying out, is it? Yeah. True, and, uh, and that is uh, the danger that lies there. And, uh, you know, I think you've been very frank uh, in your in your observation about uh, the Canada's role and the need for Canada not to be a safe heaven uh, for such uh, elements in your book. Uh, so thank you so much for speaking to the friend uh, and congratulations on this uh, wonderful book, Blood for Blood, 50 Years of Global Khalistan uh, Project, published by, of course, Harper Collins. So viewers, if you want to know about the history of Khalistan movement and the international aspect uh, of it and what all happened in the background back in history and what really lies forward, well, you need to grab a copy of this book. Thank you so much uh, for speaking to the print, Terry. Thank you very much for your interest. I enjoyed it. Thank you.